Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Jeff Kossoff, and I am a professor at the United States Naval Academy Cyber Science Department, and I'm presenting with uh, Midshipman Dennis Devey, who is a uh, first class, meaning he will be graduating next month, and we will be talking about the Cybersecurity Act of 2015 and the related laws involving monitoring, information sharing, and operating defensive measures. Uh, before we start, uh, Full disclosure, I'm a lawyer, so as most lawyers, I have a list of disclaimers that I have to present. Uh, first, everything that we say only represents our own personal views. They don't represent the views of the Naval Academy, the Department of Navy, Department of Defense, possibly each other, uh, just our own personal views. Uh, also, I am a lawyer, as I said, so I will be providing you a lot of information about laws and legal issues, but that does not substitute for legal advice. Uh, I understand there was a presentation yesterday about Maryland law, which is great because you have to always consider not just federal law, but state law, local laws, the laws of all other countries. So uh, this is just one aspect to sort of look at one some legal issues involving monitoring, information sharing, defensive measures. So uh, with that, we just wanted, before we started on the substance of the Cybersecurity Act, we wanted to talk a little bit about us, why we're doing this, why you're having people from the Naval Academy talk about uh, both public and private information sharing. Uh, I'm on the faculty of the Naval Academy Cyber Science Department, which was created a few years ago, and we have we basically have two approaches to educating our midshipmen about cyber. Every midshipman is required to take two classes in cybersecurity, regardless of their major. So a history major, a mechanical engineering major, they all take two classes that gives them a broad education on, on both the technical and policy aspects of cyber. We also have a cyber operations major where midshipmen who are particularly interested in cyber take a wide range of classes on both the technical side, uh, legal, policy, social factor side to give them a really wide ranging view of cyber. So we're really trying to um, take all approaches to educate our midshipmen. I will put in a very brief plug, our department is growing. We have a few tenure track openings available. So if anyone here has a PhD in computer science or a related field and would love to have one of the coolest jobs, I think at least in cyber in this area, please come and speak with me because it's a really great and cool opportunity. So uh, a bit of my background, I am a lawyer, as I said. I, Before coming to the Naval Academy, I represented mainly large companies, uh, both helping them plan for information uh, technology plans, but also more frequently after they had a data breach, helping with the mad scramble to figure out what we can do and minimize the chances of being sued. Uh, now at the Naval Academy, I teach cybersecurity law, cybersecurity ethics, and cybersecurity policy. And uh, I write about similar issues. I recently wrote a book about uh, the first textbook about cybersecurity law, which was published in February of this year and is already becoming outdated because there have been so many developments like what we're going to talk about today, which I find really fun. Uh, before I was a lawyer, I was a technology journalist at the Oregonian covering uh, mainly technology policy. So I have a real interest in talking about these issues and writing about them. Uh, now I'll let Midshipman Devi talk a little bit. Hey everyone, I'm Dennis Devi. So I am a Midshipman Academy. I'm graduating next month and then I'm going to go drive boats in San Diego for a couple of years. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't have a large disclaimer. Anything I say is my opinion only. Uh, I focus Red Team, Blue Team. Uh, Shout out to the members of my security team who are here right now. Uh, the reason I got into the policy side of things is I've been doing the technical for long enough and I, I wanted to figure out how it actually worked and make sure that the policy guys aren't making all the rules. Oh. With that. And I just will add, uh, Midshipman DV, he's, um, he's probably more modest than I am about his accomplishments. Uh, this path, in addition to work being on the successful CDX team, uh, last fall, he also was on a team at the NYU Cybersecurity Awareness Week pol uh, policy competition. There were more than 90 participants, mainly law school participants, and uh, Dennis and his teammate placed second nationally. So 
Um, I, I can brag a little bit about that. Uh, so anyway, enough with the introductions. What we're here to talk about today is the Cybersecurity Act of 2015. This, it was about 136 pages, so I'm not going to post every single bit of it on the slide, but I just wanted to show you what it is. It was passed in late 2015, and if you see on the uh, top of it, it says 1728. That is not a typo. It was page 1728 of a bill that was well over 2,000 pages, uh, which was the budget that was necessary to have the government running. This was something that had been debated for a very long time, and as we'll talk about, was fairly controversial for some provisions related to information sharing. And like most legislation, it ends up getting passed when it's folded into a much larger bill that needs to pass at the last minute. So uh, the, this is the bill. And uh, when I say that it had been contentious, the main issue that had arisen uh, for years and years had been that the Department of Homeland Security through US CERT had been really encouraging companies to share information about cyber threats that they'd been facing and successful ways that they had been able to defend against them. Now, from a sort of social point of view, that sounds great. You want to have as much sharing so the government knows what's happening that could help companies uh, respond to these threats because the government cares not just from an economic perspective, but from a national security perspective, as we saw, for example, with the Sony hack. So uh, for years and years, DHS had been saying, please share more information with us. And the companies had a pretty valid reason of why they didn't want to do that. And that is, we don't want to be sued. Uh, we don't want to start giving, first, we don't want to give the Federal Trade Commission, which we'll talk about in a little bit, information about possible security vulnerabilities that we should have noticed. And also, a lot of the information about cyber threats may very well contain personally identifiable information and all other sorts of uh, private matter that would be, that the company could be sued for if it provided it to the government. So the companies have been saying, we want immunity from uh, being sued for these sorts of things. There was a big spirited and pretty well-informed debate between the sort of electronic civil rights groups, corporate America, the federal government, and that's what that's really what had held up this this law from passing. There were a lot of debates about exactly how to word it, but they actually eventually, after years and years, came up with a final draft that was a compromise, and we'll talk about how they compromised, but it's basically putting some privacy protections in, some requirements for removing unnecessary personal information. But that, so that's what the Cybersecurity Act, uh, basically the debate history was. The ultimate version of the Cybersecurity Act, it's often talked about as the information sharing bill, uh, which it is. I mean, it does allow information sharing. It encourages information sharing. But there are two other provisions that are not as commonly discussed, and they received actually very little coverage in the media after this bill passed, and those were involving monitoring and defensive measures. So there are provisions in there that we're going to talk about that allow, that at least encourage, and depending on how you interpret it, allow companies to take certain steps to monitor their networks for cybersecurity threats and take defensive measures. So it's, um, it, the, but to understand sort of the scope of what they allow and how it change, changes the existing legal landscape, we have to first look at what laws currently apply and what restrictions there are. So like I said at the beginning of the presentation, this is just mainly at the federal level. Almost all of the laws that I'm talking about have state analogs, and frankly, we just don't have enough time to go over them. But I want to just at least talk about the landscape as it existed when the Cybersecurity Act passed, and then discussed whether the Cybersecurity Act actually um, changed anything. And uh, before I do that, I just also want to encourage everyone, if you have any questions along the way, please, uh, questions, comments, please uh, raise your hand throughout. I want this to be interactive, and again, these, are, these can be fairly complex uh, subjects. Uh, so the main issue for monitoring often comes up with the Wiretap Act. So the Wiretap Act prohibits the interception of the content of wire, oral, and electronic communications. For cyber, this is mostly involving electronic communications. 
there's not a very clear definition in the statute as to what interception means, but the way the courts have interpreted it, they say that it has to be contemporaneous. So it's basically data in transit being intercepted can be prohib uh, prohibited by the Wiretap Act. Now, um, the, some courts have gotten a little more expansive on it. There was a case a few years ago where an IRS employee, uh, he was concerned that his supervisor had been noticing that he wasn't in the office all that much because he wasn't in the office all that much. So his solution, rather than talk to a supervisor, was to set up an auto-forward rule on his Outlook that auto-forwarded all of the supervisor's received emails to his own personal account. I, I, I will just say as a lawyer, I highly recommend against doing this and also just a matter of HR policy, not a great idea. But uh, he was charged with violating the Wiretap Act and his, his um, argument was this was not contemporaneous because there was, the email had arrived in his supervisor's inbox before it was forwarded. And the judges, unfortunately for him, said, we're not going to buy that. It was close enough to contemporaneous that it is a violation of the Wiretap Act. Uh, the Wiretap Act carries significant criminal and civil penalties, so it's very good not to be in violation of it. So, um, but again, it really does have to do with data in transit. There, If data is stored for a while, there's another law we'll talk about in a little bit. But there are some exceptions to uh, the Wiretap Act. Uh, one is consent. So I'm sure many of your employers, when you log on, there's some banner that you don't read. Uh, typically, that is consenting to allow your data to be monitored. Uh, you need very explicit consent. Burying it in an employee handbook more and more is not seen as explicit consent, burying it in terms of use for a service. You really have to go out of your way to make sure that the, uh, that the person's providing consent. Uh, there's a wiretap order, which is basically like a warrant uh, that a court issued that requires demonstration of probable cause of a crime. Uh, providing the communications to the intended recipient, obviously that's not going to violate the Wiretap Act. Uh, the most common re uh, exceptions to the Wiretap Act is rendition of service. And this is really especially for cybersecurity purposes. So if there's an act that is necessarily incident to the rendition of service or to the protection or rights of, or property, that can be seen as an exception to the Wiretap Act. In the cybersecurity community, it's always been kind of a little unclear as to whether that can be applied to just general cybersecurity monitoring. The, and so that's one thing that the Cybersecurity Act may actually help clarify. There's also the trespasser exception. And what that basically says is that if you know there's a trespasser on your network and you consent to the government, the police, the FBI, um, getting onto your network to monitor that activity, that also can be an exception to the Wiretap Act. Um, briefly, we, we, I want to talk about stored communications. So Wiretap Act, again, is data in transit or really close to being in transit. Stored Communications Act involves data that's stored on a server. Now, the caveat here, most of these computer laws, uh, these computer crime laws, were written in the mid-'80s, and it shows. Um, so there, there's one section that uh, prohibits the intentional access without authorization of uh, data that's in electronic storage. There's a very arcane definition of what actually it means to be in electronic storage. Um, but that's basically essentially hacking into stored communications. Um, Section 702 then prohibits service providers from disclosing communications to uh, third parties with a number of exceptions. Uh, I won't go through all of them. One of them involves consent. So again, clicking on a banner saying that you do agree to doing this. They also have something in uh, a similar exception for being incident to the rendition or service of the uh, provider and protecting the property of the provider. Um, there's also a court order issue. I don't know if any of you have heard about the 180-day debate that's gone on, but basically the, the bottom line is, again, this was written in the 80s, and 
there's a rule that says that if email is unopened and on a server for less than 180 days, the government needs to get a warrant to access your stored communications. If it's older than 180 days or opened, they just need a subpoena or a court order, which is much lower standard. Congress is trying to address that um, and to make require a warrant no matter how old the information is. And there are other exceptions as well. Uh, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, I hope that everyone knows about what the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act uh, criminalizes. It's, uh, it's seven different types of activities. Uh, committing espionage, so basically any bad acts involving classified information, um, hacking to obtain information, trespassing a federal government computer, uh, doing something fraudulent on a network, causing damage on a computer, trafficking in passwords or other access issues, and just threatening to hack, uh, which basically is, are threatening to not uh, provide information back, which is essentially like ransomware. So uh, all of these involve uh, acts that are without authorization or in excess of authorization, and the courts are really divided as to what that means. Uh, briefly, I'll just say there's also privacy and data security laws. Um, there is a prohibition under the Federal Trade Commission Act of unfair and deceptive trade practices, um, basically meaning you can't lie about your data security or privacy practices, and you also just can't really be reckless with your personally identifiable information. Uh, what companies worry about most are common law claims of privacy and inadequate data security uh, under a variety of claims that have existed for hundreds of years, like negligence, breach of contract, and uh, really, I, I'll state my bias here. Uh, I'm not really a fan of plaintiff's lawyers because <laughs> they will try to come up with anything after a data breach or some sort of uh, accidental loss of personal information to bring a lawsuit against um, companies. So it's something to be really careful about. They file class action lawsuits that can cause damages in the tens of millions of dollars. We also have industry-specific laws that require data security and privacy protections. HIPAA, which covers health and health providers. The Gramm-Leach-Bliley Act that covers um, financial institutions. A Video Privacy Protection Act, which uh, there's a long history involving a Supreme Court nominee's video rental records being disclosed, but that covers video viewing information. The Securities and Exchange Commission requires companies to disclose certain cybersecurity vulnerabilities. And there's a California law called CALAPA, which requires companies to post their privacy practices. So now we're going to get, that's the background. Uh, what I want to do now is talk about how the Cybersecurity Act may change that landscape. And the caveat I have here is we're not entirely sure. Uh, as of this morning, there's not a single court opinion that has interpreted the Cybersecurity Act. It was passed about a year and a half ago, so um, there may be some cases in the pipeline, but right now it's really all we have is basically the, the text of the law. We don't have courts saying how to approve it, how, how to um, implement it. But um, the monitoring provision, again, did not get very much attention, partly because nobody knows what it means. So it starts off with notwithstanding any other provision of law. Does anyone have any guess as to what that might mean? Notwithstanding. Good. So basically, as long as there's not a law, another law barring it. Yeah, that's that's definitely one one interpretation. Yep. Yes, and that's uh, that's how some interpret it. And there's a whole other school of thought and court opinions that say notwithstanding any other provision law of law means that if the Cybersecurity Act conflicts with the Wiretap Act, that you would then ignore the Wiretap Act. Uh, but the two interpretations that you had say otherwise. The, basically, there's no settled definition of why notwithstanding any other provision of law is in any statute because it confuses every judge and every lawyer. Um, I refer to it as one of the sort of terms that's the Full Employment for Lawyers Act because 
It justifies us billing hundreds and hundreds of dollars an hour to make our arguments about it. So um, what it could mean, let's at least what companies are trying to say, is this takes priority over other laws. So if it does, then a company may, for cybersecurity purposes, monitor, and it, what it basically says, it, they can monitor their own systems, they can monitor the systems of the federal government or another company if they get written consent, and they can monitor information stored on all of those things. Um, so let's just say that that notwithstanding is the interpretation that companies would like to go with. So it's only for a cybersecurity purpose. So what the statute defines cybersecurity purpose as is the purpose of protecting an information system or information that is stored on, processed by, or transiting an information system from a cybersecurity threat or security vulnerability. Excellent. What are cybersecurity threats or cybersecurity vulnerabilities? Uh, what the statute says here is that um, a cybersecurity threat and I, I won't read the whole thing, but it uh, could adversely impact the security, availability, confidentiality, or integrity of an information system. Okay, so that's pretty broad. Uh, it's not just violating the terms of use, but cybersecurity threat seems to be something that you can make an argument that so many different things constitute cybersecurity threats. It's not a small, discrete list. It also applies to security vulnerabilities, any attribute of hardware, software, process, or procedure that could enable or facilitate the defeat of a security control. Excellent. We have this incredibly broad cybersecurity purpose. Uh, so if you're monitoring for a cybersecurity purpose, you can monitor your own networks or get the consent of another company or government agency to monitor their networks. Um, so I will turn it over to Mitch Mendivi to talk a bit more about what this might mean in practice. So in practice, this might not actually change all that much because a lot of these companies have been doing it internally and have just assumed that they're never going to get sued. So it's going to, internally it's going to be logging as much as possible for the SOC, capturing as much network traffic in case you have to do incident response, logging all the metadata, just see if something you can easily search. Or one of the big things that this might allow you to do is some of the more interesting things, like say, reading the content of your employees' emails. Ordinarily, that requires a pretty large consent form. You have to be able to prove there's consent. With this, there's a reasonable chance that as long as you're monitoring strictly for, def for defensive purposes and you're only using the information for defensive purposes, you're totally covered and don't even have to prove that the employee consented to the monitoring of their communications. Um, the primary change is that it eliminates the liability under the existing statutes if we're interpreting, interpreting notwithstanding the way that we are. And the way that it's likely to be pushed. Um, another big thing for monitoring is the ability for a third party to monitor a network. Previously, that was a slightly unsafe scenario because there's a chance that you wind up sharing PII and wind up becoming liable for this security breach. This act is made to make it slightly more difficult for you to get sued and will act as an insulating factor. Um, next, we're just going to go to the defense measures where things are a little bit more interesting because it's authorizing a lot of things because of the very broad sweeps of what a cybersecurity purpose is. So what this is saying is, notwithstanding again, a private entity may operate a defensive measure for any information system that they own, any information system that they have received written consent to operate on, and, and on any federal entity's systems as long as they have consent. So what kind of defense? No, that doesn't mean hackbacks. Sorry, booze. Sorry, Raytheon. Uh, it's going, it, the defensive action, while an action device procedure signature, it's mitigating a known or cybersecurity threat or security vulnerability. But the key thing is that it is a measure that does not destroy, render unusable, or provide unauthorized access to, which means that it's very unlikely that you are going to ever be able to make a successful case for hacking back under the Cybersecurity Act, or using the Cybersecurity Act as your authorization. So what are examples? There's all the boring examples, IDS, IPS, so anything that's doing intrusion detection, intrusion protection, firewall rules, but and the things that we've been doing forever. Some of the more interesting things that are on the cutting edge and some companies might not have felt comfortable doing. Uh, one ex first example is honey tokens and honey files. 
So the idea of a honey token is an embedded URL that's unique that allows a organization to monitor access to a file. So just like a web bug, every time this resource gets loaded, it's going to make a hit in the log and record the IP that came from, maybe some more information. So you can hide these tokens in anything from documents to web pages to inside databases. So you can actually put it inside a SQL database. So if that database gets read, it's going to make a call to that and log that. Um, so using internally to detect intrusions is something that a lot of companies have been starting to do. Um, but externally is a little sketchy because you're winding up running, having a callback from someone else's domain. And there's a very good chance that under previous laws, someone could get upset when they see your Word document beaking back to them. Um, under the Cybersecurity Act of 2015, there's a very good chance that you could embed a token in a document, send it out, and it, or put it on your network, and if it gets taken by an attacker, once they bring it back to their network and open it back, it'll make a request, that IP will get logged, and you'll have a pretty reasonable place to start your investigation, as well as being uh, notified that you have had a breach. Um, so that's not hacking back in any way. That is, in, that is, there's absolutely no access. It is them making a request, and that is a very safe move now. Um, and just a quick pitch for canarytokens.org. It's a free service. It's absolutely incredible, and will allow you to download all the images you need to open that up for your own organization so you don't have to use their infrastructure. It can be all your own infrastructure, and you can start doing this. So the more exciting bit of this, what if, what if you took that idea of having a document that was stolen call back to you to the extremes. So you have to remember the defender cannot adversely affect the attacker's network and the defender must not gain authorized access, unauthorized access. So there is a very fine line between the CFAA and the Cybersecurity Act. There's a reasonable chance, and again, this is something that is going to have to get worked through by the legal side, but there's a reasonable chance under the cur our current interpretation of the Cybersecurity Act that mirroring the honey file concept, you could put a piece of basically a word macro malware inside of a document so that when it gets stolen, it gets opened on the, on, the, on the attacker's box and that piece of malware runs a system profiler, collects as much information about the system as possible, sends it back to the defender's organization and then deletes itself. Now, that's a bit of a stretch it's, very, it's, it's something that is going to have to get worked through, but there's a very reasonable chance that we will start seeing that in the next few years. As long as the code is proven to be completely safe, it's, it's, the effects are localized, there's no chance of it spreading, there's no chance of, authorized, of access continuing after the initial profile. Um, so that's just something to look out for, and if you want to try and argue that in a longer document, definitely a place to be. Another thing that we're starting to see are integrated defenses. So this is hardware manufacturers, operating system developers. So seeing, seeing things right now like integrated anti-malware, Windows Defender is one of the best examples of this. Um, the ability for a company that makes these systems to put, put something on, not worry about um, monopoly laws, not worry about trust laws, and be able to take ac action without the user's consent on a machine that they own or on, on an operating system that they developed. Um, another interesting possibility is for a organization that makes perhaps Internet of Things devices to have their own access tool, to retain some sort of access to it so that they are able to reach back in and remove malware anytime, that's, anytime that they detect it affecting their things. Whether or not vendors actually implement that sort of thing is up for, the, up for them. And so it's unlikely to be seeing that in webcams, but Microsoft's already seeing it, and I expect to start seeing it across other devices in the future. So the third prong of the Cybersecurity Act is the information sharing provision. And again, as I discussed earlier, this is what's gotten the most attention, had gotten the most controversy because there's this concern that companies will be sharing highly sensitive private customer information with the government, with other companies. Uh, so this final negotiated version attempted to strike a balance between those concerns. So the one really important point to remember is that this is voluntary. So it says that if you're a company you, and you have cyber threat information or defensive measures that have been successful, you're allowed to share the, them with the federal government and other companies. 
uh, there's no duty to share. So even if you see the just a really terrible threat and you're, you've been participating in this program before, you have no obligation to tell DHS, to tell other companies. That's going to be a business decision that you're going to have to make. Um, also, if you're receiving information through this U.S. CERT run program, you have no duty to warn anyone based on that information. Uh, the Cybersecurity Act, both in this section and also in other provisions that really aren't part of this talk, really further centralized cyber homeland cybersecurity civilian defense to the Department of Homeland Security, including uh, responsibility for administering this information sharing program. And DHS has a lot of discretion, a lot of leeway in determining what are adequate safeguards for these programs. So if you're going to participate in this program and try to seek immunity from any liability, you need to make sure that you're part, that you're complying with DHS's guidelines and policies. Uh, DHS over the past year has released a number of uh, guidance documents that really help companies figure out how to participate in this. Um, so this is actually the provision from the law. It says that if you're a non-federal entity, basically if you're a private company, private association, for a cybersecurity purpose and protecting classified information, you can share, receive uh, any, both with other private companies or the federal government, a cyber threat indicator or defensive measure. Okay, so we talked about defensive measures, but what's a cyber threat indicator? So um, I apologize for... Uh, how small this print is, that's because this is actually from the statute and they went, the DHS went to great lengths to make this as broad as possible. So basically, because they want as much information shared that companies feel willing to give. So it's anomalous patterns of communications, um, a method of defeating a security controller, exploiting a security vulnerability, the actual security vulnerability, including any anomalous activity that indicates the existence of a security vulnerability, uh, a method of causing a user with legitimate access to a system um, to unwittingly enable the defeat of a security control, uh, malicious command and control, actual and potential harm caused by an incident, and any other attribute of a cybersecurity threat if the disclosure is not otherwise permitted by law or any combination thereof. So this is basically lawyer's way of saying you can justify pretty much anything being a cyber threat indicator. I want to go on record in a brief on that, but I mean that's basically what the what Congress was intending when they drafted this. Uh, now, Mitch and Devi will talk about some examples of cyber threat indicators. So, while the lawyers made the Threat, the definition for threat indicators as broad as humanly possible. In terms of what's actually useful, it winds up being pretty narrow. So it's going to be anything that you're going to be trying to put into your intr intrusion detection system, anything you're putting into your intrusion protection system. So you, you could say an I IP address is uh, really any sort of exploit, uh, discovered vulnerabilities, malware hashes, malware families, um, domain names, IPs, and just straight up threat intelligence, and again, of course, of varying use. But the point of the legal side was to make it so that you could share whatever was whatever was deemed necessary. Um, on this, on the technical side, there's it winds up being a lot less that actually winds up getting shared. So just the mechanisms that uh, there have been many attempts at creating different ways to share information, and finally one has really taken hold, and that's the Stick Cybox Taxi, and that's really heavily backed by the Department of Homeland Security and U.S. CERT. And that's really going a long way towards making it so that intelligence can get shared and in a usable manner and be used in a timely fashion. Um, there are definite concerns, so there are technical safeguards, and that's basically based off of the design of these things. There's, there's no mechanism for sharing of logs, there's no mechanism for sharing of documents, um, as well as the legal safeguards. So there's a mandatory removal of personally identifiable information if you know that there is personally identifiable information in there. Um, so that is a major caveat. There is a slight chance that you could wind up sharing one of these indicators that could have personally identifiable information. Um, but really the main takeaway from this is it is very difficult to trample on people's rights with sticks rules. 
So just going through it, I mean, XML formatted, we're, the, I chose the two examples for Sticks and Cybox that have the most information you can possibly put in about, an, about a single person. And this is the default example for sharing information about a threat organization. And this is one for uh, all the information that you can possibly put on a uh, HTTPS certificate. So as, as great as the concerns are, that this does authorize uh, the sharing of documents and perhaps let's one example I've been seeing thrown around is the idea that a document could have a piece of malware embedded in it they share the document that has the malware in it of course it, that there's that is a valid use case and then the documents filled with PII um, right now there's no good mechanism to do that until a mechanism is created to do that um, there's really not too much of a concern about it So we wanted to talk a little bit about both the immunity and the privacy protections that the Cybersecurity Act provides, both for information sharing and for monitoring, because again, that's really one of the most controversial parts of this law. So um, because privacy was really of the utmost concern, there was a lot of discussion about how do, what do we do to protect privacy? So if it's, for example, uh, a bank that's had a cybersecurity attack, there there needs to, to be some way that the bank doesn't necessarily provide every customer bank record to DHS, to other companies, because that's highly sensitive personal information, and most privacy advocates would say there's no good reason to do that. So there are a number of provisions in the law that says both DHS develops its own guidelines for protecting privacy, but also that uh, companies before sharing any of the cyber threat indicators with anyone else, they have to go through the information and see if they're, and remove any personal information that's not directly related to the cybersecurity threat. Again, uh, you could pay a lawyer who charges hundreds of dollars an hour to make an argument about why personal information might somehow be directly related to the cybersecurity threat. I think given the language in the statute, it's very hard. I think, but there are also some privacy folks who say it's actually much easier than you would think to justify that, and they're still very concerned about large lists of consumer names, customers' emails, all that sort of thing being provided under this. Um, so I think right, we haven't, again, we haven't seen any major cases arising from this yet. I think eventually we probably will, and then we'll be able to get further guidance from the courts and from DHS as to what actual, what personal information actually is directly related to the threat. Um, so here's the protection from liability. This again, this was the big sticking point because there were a number of concerns, particularly after the Snowden rev revelations that telecommunications companies and the government would just use this as a way to share any sorts of information um, between companies and the government and be completely immune from it if they just say that it's for a private, uh, cybersecurity purpose. Um, the, so the immunity provision actually covers both monitoring and information sharing. Uh, so it says that basically you can't sue a company, uh, for monitoring an information system and information conducted under the Cybersecurity Act. So again, for cybersecurity purposes. Depending on how broadly courts define cybersecurity purposes, that could be a huge deal or it could be not any change at all. Uh, if cybersecurity purpose is defined really broadly, this could prov provide much more flexibility for monitoring without companies facing any litigation. But again, that's just something that we're going to have to find out with time as courts rule on it. Uh, the information sharing immunity, Again, it basically says you can share these cyber threat indicators or defensive measures as long as you comply both with the any requirements that DHS imposes and also these privacy rules. So redacting any unnecessary personal information. Cybersecurity Act also protects companies from regulators. One concern that I've heard from companies over the years is why on earth would we want to give the federal government, and they frankly see the federal government as one large entity, why would we want to give the federal government vast amounts of information about why we were hacked? Uh, just for background, I mentioned the FTC. 
the FTC will bring enforcement actions against companies that have uh, what they would say either deceptive or unfair data security. And typically in like 99% of the cases, you basically settle with the FTC before they get to sue you. The good news is if it's a first time violation and you're not operating under a previous consent decree, you don't have to pay any money. The bad news is that you do have to agree to what I tell my clients is basically a 20 year root canal by the FTC. What they do is they take they retain the ability to basically oversee your entire data security program, require constant audits. Uh, it's incredibly costly. And if you're found in violation, you can face vast penalties. So you don't want to have to do that. So companies say, why would I give this information to the federal government? If they're going to, DHS just passes it on to the FTC. The FTC says, hey, why did you not require your um, all your employees to use anything other than password as their password? And uh, that so 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 that was the concern. So to address this, the Congress said that basically if, if companies provide any federal agency information through the threat sharing program, they don't have this information cannot be used directly or indirectly against them in a regulatory proceeding. However, uh, the federal government can basically use the information that it learns through this program to develop future regulations. So if it's looking to see what sort of cybersecurity threats are go are companies facing, they could develop regulations along those lines. Uh, the final sort of immunity is for antitrust violations. So and under antitrust law, companies can't collude with competitors. So um, just a Free legal tip, if you're in a, uh, if you're talking with a competitor, it's friend, fine to be friends with competitors. Never ever talk about what prices you're going to set. If you do that, that's a violation of antitrust laws. They have criminal, civil penalties that are not very fun to face. So, uh, the concern that companies had here is if I'm sharing information about a phishing campaign, for example, with a competitor, is that going to be seen as an antitrust violation? So that's why Congress put in this exception saying, by participating in the uh, in this program, you're not going to be facing any antitrust liability. So uh, in conclusion, and something that I wanted to get that we wanted to get your thoughts on, uh, we in the past year since this has really been active, there's not been a tremendous amount of participation from the private sector. There's some, and it's growing. But there have been about 100 companies that have participated overall. That's not very much, or at least that was as of this winter. Um, so does anyone have any thoughts about what needs to change based on what you've heard? Uh, anyone in the private sector, would you participate in this? Do you participate in it? Yeah, I think that's a great point. I mean, maybe only allow companies to receive information if they help out, make it communal rather than sort of um, take your chances and uh, if you want to be nice, <laughs> then participate. Um, has anyone else had any experience with the program? Okay. Any any other any questions about it? Yep. Sure. So it depends on what the actual damage was, but if it's, but typically it would probably be a, it would be definitely those negligence, breach of contract, breach of warranty lawsuits, uh, especially if there was any physical damage from a malfunctioning device, something like that. Um, 
the again the the way that that works is that typically the plaintiff's lawyers will file a class action lawsuit whichever plaintiff actually gets uh is able to handle this multi-district litigation they basically hit the jackpot <laughs> because they get a percentage of, on behalf of every affected consumer regardless of whether the person is a named plaintiff. So I think that would be the most likely. The Federal Trade Commission has indicated that it's focusing more and more on Internet of Things uh, and security of Internet of Things devices. So I think they're probably going to get more active in filing enforcement actions on that. Do you want to talk about it? Are, so are you talking about the, which which botnet are you I just want to make sure that I'm commenting on the correct one. Oh, the Kilio. Oh, the takedown. Okay. Okay. I thought you said operating the botnet too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There's. Yeah. So that actually deals more, that, that was a very successful FBI operation under the new Rule 41, which I'm sure many of you have heard about, it was very controversial, that allows magistrate judges to issue these uh, na these nationwide warrants uh, for the Kilios botnet. So that's, that more uh, is under sort of the criminal enforcement authority. So, uh, but the legal authority that allowed that was more the change to the warrants. <laughs> So, I totally agree, and I hate to be that guy to bring medical into it, but I kind of see it as, like vaccines, until you reach a critical mass of people sharing this information, it's going to wind up just being, a, a, I mean, it's 100, maybe 120 companies at this point, and they're sharing not, not enough intelligence to even come close to justifying the huge upfront cost of setting up a full taxi system on your network. So, it's public, it's, it's public service for now. Um, there, right now, there's no way that somebody can look at it and say, this is going to make us money. But in the future, once you get enough people in the ecosystem sharing information, I think that's what's really going to push it over the edge. So that one is not not the true definition of a honey pile. That one is, I mean, it's, it's basically a straight up access tool. But that is one that, as it, I, I feel that if you worked through with the DHS and said this is what we are trying to create, these are the specific actions that are going to be taken by this tool, and call it something like a defensive investigative tool, you would have to work it through legal channels. You would have to get approval from them before you start using it. But there's a reasonable chance that if you constrain the activity such that there is absolutely no way that it could be viewed as 
being used for access, you'd be able to pull that off legally. It's definitely close. There, but CFA is a, is a beast. So honey file is just the idea of you take the honey token, that unique URL that when accessed pops up a log for you, and a honey file is just any file that you embed that in. So that can be something as simple as a Word document that has a very easier example than that. But uh, any file that when accessed is going to wind up sending this request out of your network and back. Yeah. I, so if the competitor received the vulnerability, if, if it was something that, and hopefully they, typically they will be alerted to it um, as long as it doesn't violate the uh, equities process. But um, y but I, uh, frankly, I think it increases the chances because if you're facing a lawsuit in negligence, inadequate data security, all sorts of uh, causes of action, you really, knowledge of a problem that you don't fix if that goes to a jury, that's really going to hurt you. Uh, so I, I think that's a really good point. The chances of an organization having a full taxi set up and not being able to patch enough things to be covered legally is unlikely. Like, uh, like what if you had an IoT like, uh, security camera and uh, you reported that vulnerability? Security camera system? I'm not a lawyer, but uh, the... The, the liability is usually gross negligence, something along the lines of you really just didn't try. Okay, we're, we're getting the signal that our time is up. Uh, if you have any other questions, please uh, ask us in person, email us. Happy to talk about this more. Um, thank you so much.